Hello and welcome to our We Are BBC Good Food series in which we introduce you to our team and contributors. I'm Keith Kendrick, magazine's editor, and I'm delighted to welcome Rosie Burkett, food writer, stylist, TV presenter and co-presenter on the BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge. Hi Rosie, how are you doing? Hello, I'm good, thank you. Yeah, great. Happy to be here. How are things in your part of the world, which is Kent, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Um, so they are, they're good. They're very hot. Um, I know we've been talking about that already, how hot it is. Um, but yeah, lovely and sunny down here um, and in, in the midst of summer. So um, enjoying all the lovely produce and everything that's uh, around at the moment. So how's, um, how's lockdown been affecting you over the last few months? Have you learned any new skills, come up with any more uh, new recipes? How's it, how's it been? Tended to your allotment, perhaps? Uh, well, my allotment has been somewhat neglected, um, but we have been, yeah, I've been cooking loads. Um, I've been, yeah, just kind of, I think like everyone, it's all, it's all suddenly become about the home cooking. And for me, I went into overdrive um, sort of manically cooking up recipes and, and I felt kind of compelled to share, um, to share my knowledge and, and, everything that I was cooking all the time because I know that so many people were looking for um, you know for inspiration and for ideas so I kind of was just cooking non-stop um, and yeah I, I definitely got back into sourdough after a bit of a hi hiatus um, and made loads of pizzas was really enjoying my pizza oven um, made fish and chips I did a lot of kind of food that you miss you know that that we couldn't actually get hold of because yeah. of lockdown um, so yeah, I made, I had to go at some lovely samosas, um, and yeah, just kind of cooking nonstop. I feel like people that love food were, were sort of slightly lucky really, because there wasn't much else that we could do. Well, I, I, I resisted the sourdough bandwagon for a long time because I just thought it was going to take ages and ages of, you know, kneading and pounding. But then I, um, then I looked at our own Barney Desmazeri's, um, sort of masterclasses, and it's incredibly therapeutic, isn't it? It's incredibly easy and it's so yeah. satisfying and rewarding. It's just, you know, grow that starter for five days and then, you know, add some water, add some salt, do a bit of twisting and folding, keep leaving it. Yeah. And then the next day, you've just... so it's, uh, Yeah, it's amazing. And I think so many people felt, you know, just felt like they had the time because the thing with having a, a sourdough starter is, you know, you do have to tend to it a little bit. And, you know, although it can sit quite happily for a while in the fridge you know when you're baking regularly you have to keep feeding it and I think for some people who are leading busy lives and out and about you know going to the office or whatever it's not a realistic it's not achievable but because so you know because we were all stuck at home people really their imaginations really got captured by making sourdough and, and realizing how you know how natural and easy it is to do. So yeah I've been you know going i've been baking a sourdough loaf uh, a day um wow i've i've kind of i i i've pulled back from it a little bit because my kids aren't as impressed with my uh, sourdough bread as i am um which has meant that i've got quite a few crusts lying around stale crusts and i wonder if you had any advice on what i might uh, might do with those Oh, yeah. Well, don't throw them away. Um, there's so many things you can do with, with leftover sourdough. And I think everyone's in the same boat because the, the end of the um, loaf tends to go a bit stale and it's really hard to cut, isn't it? So you end up with these kind of like ends of sourdough. Um, so what I tend to do is make um, breadcrumbs. That's kind of always a good thing to have in. Um, you know, you can make you can blitz them up into breadcrumbs and have them in the freezer for when you want to do a nice crunchy topping for something or you want to panne something or anything like that. Another thing is making croutons. Um, so kind of rip, if it's still, you know, um, not too stale to rip apart, rip them up and toss them in a bit of olive oil. I've been adding actually anchovy fillets into my croutons lately, like chopping up anchovies and putting them in with my croutons and olive oil. And the anchovies go really, really crispy. Um, and that kind of coats the, the, the breadcrumbs. So you get these lovely, you know, savory anchovy breadcrumbs, which is great for salads, especially Caesar salads and stuff like that. So um, croutons and breadcrumbs is an obvious one. And then other than that, you know, using um, using them for thickening up gazpacho or um, you can soak them in a bit of milk or in a bit of water um, to soften them up and then use them as a, as a lovely thickener for really good in gazpacho, really good in romesco sauce. Um, nice to add into kind of any sauce that you're going to blitz up um, 
and yeah, use it like that really as an ingredient as well. Well, you've also got a great recipe in um, in uh, this month's August issue of uh, of Good Food, which is a uh, roast fennel and bread gratin. I think that uses sourdough as well. I presume yeah. that it, it soaks up all the all the juices. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, fennel is quite um, it releases quite a lot of moisture when it's roasted. So the sourdough soaks up those uh, lovely fennel flavors and also the cream um, that you gratinate it with. So that's that's another really good one as well. So every month, uh, Rosie, you uh, you focus on a, a star ingredient. Yeah. Um, and this month in August, it's fennel. Uh, what what other things can we do with fennel? Oh, gosh, fennel is... I mean, the thing is with fennel is it's quite divisive because some people really don't like anise flavours. Um, so if, you don't, if you're not a fan of those kind of licorice anise flavours, then you might not be into fennel as much as me. But I absolutely love fennel. Um, and there's so much you can do with it. Slice it up uh, raw, very finely. It's wonderful in a salad, you know, with lemon juice and olive oil. Um, actually, one of the recipes in the current issue with fennel uses um, uh, raw sliced fennel and pickled peaches. So pickling the, the peaches that are so good at the moment. And then roasted um, almonds. They're roasted with a bit of smoked paprika. So they're nice and crunchy and a little bit spicy. Um, and that's a, a lot. It's a lovely salad. So, um, I've got a wedding anniversary coming. And, oh, uh, congratulations. I'm planning, <laughs> and I'm planning to do a, a kind of a uh, braised chicken legs and, mm. and roast a crown. But I was thinking about putting uh, fennel instead of braising uh, legs. Is mm -hmm. that, you advise that? Is that a good, um, good oh, shout? I think, I think that would be lovely because when you, when you sort of slow roast, and it really kind of intensifies and caramelizes and it goes all soft and the sugars really come out so it becomes sweeter and that will pick up on all those delicious sticky chicken juices. It's amazing, Keith. We're coming into uh, the end of summer and September is famously a big harvest season. Some incredible produce um, around. Uh, can you talk us through some of your favorite ingredients uh, around um, that time of year? Yeah, so, I mean, the next, the next seasonal star is all about squash. Um, and that's a big one for me. Um, and it's kind of something to look forward to, um, especially when you're on the allotment. You know, you watch them kind of you watch the the squash plants growing and their vines kind of stretching out um, and their tendrils. And then they sort of swell up and, and, and get nice and uh, ni nice and uh, ready to harvest. And um, yeah, so I love I love using um, squash. There's so many varieties, aren't there? So yeah. many varieties. Uh, the, my neighbour gets a delivery uh, from, you know, from one of the uh, the organic companies and she always gives me the squash because she doesn't like them, which I think is uh, is, is rather foolish. Do you have a favourite type of squash? Oh, well, I love um, red curry squash. That's a really sweet one. Um, Crown Prince is absolutely delicious, really rich and kind of, yeah, because some of them are more kind of creamy and luxurious than other varieties. Um, but, yeah, it's just about basically getting out there and, and trying them out and seeing what you prefer. If you prefer a kind of richer squash, um, like a crown prince, then that's that's a really, really good one. But if you prefer those lighter kind of summer squashes, um, like spaghetti squash, which really is just a vehicle for butter, I think, and black pepper. Um, and I love just cutting those in half, roasting them, and then just pulling the, um, the flesh and just, oh, so good with either like butter or cheese. Um, yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Um, and one of the recipes that I've done in the new issue is a kind of um, a, a big pasta bake with um, squash and um, sausage meat. And it's got um, a bechamel that you make with um, infused with sage and brown butter. So it's it's like a kind of it's slightly inspired by the famous tortelli di zucca um, mm -hmm. from Italy. And um, it's got all those flavors going on. And you've got the lovely sweetness of the squash with the salty sausage meat. And I think that's something that works really well, that contrast. I'll definitely be giving that a go. I, I, because there's so much pro produce around at that time of year, um, there all, there's also a glut of things. And people don't tend to know uh, you know what to do with it. Maybe just put it in the compost, and then that's it. But you know, what about pickling and preserving? Is there is there any advice and tips you can give us around what we can do and how we can do it? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely pickling and preserving, lovely things to do. And if you've got the time, you know, to take an afternoon and um, take some of your your harvest haul and preserve them 
um, then that's a lovely that's a lovely thing to do because then you can just keep dipping into into whatever you've made and it uh, you know especially with fermented ingredients like I, I keep getting kohlrabi in my um, veg box at the moment and it's one of those vegetables that you sometimes don't really know what to do with, with because it hasn't got a particularly interesting flavor it's quite watery and while it's got a lovely crunch to it it's not you know you don't go oh I love the flavor of kohlrabi because it's just not got that, Rosie, um, but that to, sorry to interrupt what's kohlrabi it's like a kind of bulbous like bulb um and it's kind of it's similar to a radish but it's much harder um so that they are kohlrabi is absolutely great for fermenting um and when you ferment it 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 you know it turns sour it's tangy it's got a lot more going on so that's definitely an example of a summer vegetable that really benefits from fermenting um and also i i've i've experimented over the years with fermenting tomatoes um, and that was something that the Ukrainian food writer Olya Hercules kind of um, brought to my attention in her first book Mamushka and when you ferment tomatoes because of the water content in them they go kind of fizzy so that's an amazing if you're growing your own tomatoes at yeah, the moment there's so many tomatoes around at the moment aren't they it's all yeah. this sunshine I guess he's really you know forcing it on well, uh, that's it. Explode, yeah. And I mean, my tomato, I don't know if you're growing tomatoes, my tomatoes are still green and still need a lot of um, sunshine to ripen up. But if you like, if you wait towards the end of the summer, the tomatoes just keep getting better and better. Um, so that's definitely an ingredient that I that I love at this time of year and, you know, into September that they're just the British tomatoes get better. I'm going to have to transcribe this interview because this all sounds absolutely amazing to me. Uh, I guess a lot of your, the recipes that you've been talking about, or certainly the inspiration, is in your uh, in your book, The Joyful Home Cook. Um, what's that about? What's the inspiration behind it? It's been out a little while now. Yeah, so it came out last year, and um, it really is all about getting people excited about home cooking. So the, the title kind of gives it away. Um, I wanted to really emphasize the joy of cooking and the joy of kind of connecting with ingredients and using your hands and making things from scratch. Um, but also, you know, giving people ideas and shortcuts and hacks and lots of tips for things to make to keep in this is something that I really think I really believe strongly is taking a little bit of time when you feel like it not when you're rushed or you're stressed or you haven't got time but when you when you've got a nice afternoon um, and a lot of us have had a lot more time on our hands lately obviously because of COVID um, you know taking that time to make something really interesting and delicious that can add an extra dimension to your food so there's a lot of that throughout the book as well as recipes um, you know everything from simple suppers to you know bigger fish and more kind of complex dishes more more like wow dishes um, there's also lots of things like there's lots of ferments and pickles and sauces and butters and and little things that you can make and keep in and freeze and then bust out to kind of add a, an extra dimension and extra wow to your cooking so I really wanted to collect all the things that I've learned over the last 12 years working in food um, and with chefs and interviewing chefs and running my own pop-ups and doing guest dinners and learning from other chefs and you know the whole industry it's such a collaborative thing um, and I've picked up so many things like like fermenting and making sourdough and all these things that have changed my cooking my home cooking for better and I wanted to kind of put them all in a book and then you know let people um, pick and choose what they want to do and hopefully feel inspired and give them new ideas. Well I'm inspired I'm sure everyone Everybody who's watching this will be inspired. So oh, thanks, thanks, Rosie. Find Rosie's seasonal thanks, features Keith. in BBC Good Food magazine on sale now. And don't forget, you can uh, you can hear Rosie on our um, BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge, where everything is discussed from baking to barbecues. You find it online at bbcgoodfood.com. Have a great day and thank you, Rosie. Take care. Thanks, Keith. Bye.